what is the best approach of understanding mosque architecture? For example, if you go to Kuala Lumpur, you see a very modern looking mosque in the Masjid Negara. And then if you go to Putrajaya, you see a different sort of mosque, a little bit of Samarkand, a little bit of uh, Middle East in there. So what are the things that would influence the architecture of a mosque? We could start uh, understanding mosques, first of all, by understanding what makes architecture in the sense of uh, the forces that influence the shape of the building. Now, there are various uh, forces that are involved, but I will concentrate on just a few. Let me uh, give you an example. Yeah. In the traditional society, okay, let's say a long time ago, uh, there were three uh, main uh, forces that would shape a building. Uh, that would be culture, uh, that would be technology, and also the influence of climate. Mm -hmm. Now let's take, for instance, the Malay architecture, traditional Malay architecture in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. We are here in the tropical uh, climate, right. and we have a lot of timber. Now, of course, culture governs the spaces. Where do you put the serambi, mm -hmm. and what is the purpose of the serambi? Men for talking, the rumah ibu, mm -hmm. or the main house, women, and also for formal location, the tapu for basic utilities. Mm -hmm. And so you have the arrangement of spaces. But what makes the building the shape of the building? Now that is about technology and climate. Mm -hmm. Now technology depends on the material that are available. If you have timber, mm -hmm. then you are talking about straight members. And therefore you have straight columns and you have straight beams. Sometimes you have arches. So technology also governs, for instance, that the roof uh, would be wedge shape or mm -hmm. prism -like mm -hmm. or pyramid like. Why? Because you don't have uh, waterproofing membrane, so you want to shed off the water supply. Right. So there's no mystical idea about why it's like uh, shaped in this manner or, or, or that mm -hmm. generally, yeah. um, but it is based on function. Mm -hmm. So you have therefore what we call linear architecture, right. which is box-like, you know, square cubes or cuboid with a prism or a pyramid for you. I suppose if you go to let's say Egypt, mm -hmm. there is not much timber. And what do you have in Egypt? You have a lot of mud, mm -hmm. and we call it um, stones. Mm -hmm. So there goes for masonry architecture. Mm -hmm. Now, in masonry architecture, you're talking about either taking stone, cutting it, and making little bricks, or you, you, you're using mud, yeah. uh, mixing with straw, like in the Egyptian time, the old, they right. built the pyramids and all that. Then you would make it into a brick form, mm -hmm. and you would uh, arrange this. Mm -hmm. The structural, um, uh, form that will come up is more circular or oval and if you want to have a door or you want to have a room that has like a, a space without a column you have to use a dome and you would also have to have arches because uh, masonry like stones cannot span um, between two uh, between two, two points okay? so sometimes people get very mystical about domes Actually, most of the time, it's we say pragmatic or, or, or functional. Mm -hmm. So these are the forces that would shape the thing. Right. Now, in the present time, technology does not figure out too much because we are in a situation where we could build almost any size of building in any shape we want to. So technology, as opposed to the traditional past, no longer figures out. Mm -hmm. Here you could, uh, let's say in the olden days, you only have timber around in the forest. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you don't have timber, you can order some from another place. Likewise, if you don't have steel or a whole space frame system, uh, you could order somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Now, in the olden days, you only have certain way to span a space. But now, you could span a large space like uh, Masjid Nagara or National yes. Mosque. You could use a space frame system with a flat roof with waterproofing. You could have uh, rib domes if you want. You could have folded plates mm -hmm. reinforced, which is what Masjid Nagara is. Yeah. You could have portal frames. You could have a number of uh, right. structural systems. Uh, and the shape, you could have it in many various shapes. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to the question of mosque and Malaysia right. and, and, and modern architecture, when you look at the national mosque, Masjid Nagara, and you look at Putra Mosque, first of all, you must identify them as, we call it national monuments. Mm -hmm. Now, with national monuments, there are two primary factors involved in its influence. Mm -hmm. One, I would turn as the political 
factor. Mm -hmm. The other would be the architectural ideas or architectural movements right. at prevailing at that time. I will explain about Masjid Negara first. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, Masjid Negara was built or uh, designed in the late 50s and was built in the uh, early 60s. Uh, at that time, the Tunku was in how oh, he was the prime minister, prime minister, and Malaysia was just newly independent. Newly independent. Yeah. So, what do you have? The political scenario at the time, you have a newly independent nation that, uh, in a sense, asks the question of what is Malaysian identity, mm -hmm. because before that you only have Malay, you have Chinese, yeah. you have Indian. Yeah. Before that, you would just have Malay, mm -hmm. and perhaps before that you have Indian, Sri Vijaya. Yeah. I'm not sure about. Uh, in, the, in those uh, olden days. Now you have a thing called Malaysia. So what should it be in terms of the shape? And furthermore, you have Islam, the factor of Islam and as the national mosque. Now, this is how I read the situation. Tunku was fresh, uh, becoming a, a prime minister, and the racial balance at the time was about 50% Malay, 35% percent Chinese and 10 or 15 percent Indian something like that so you have almost a, an equal number or equal, uh, almost a balanced uh, idea of this race. so the question of being too Malay mm -hmm. in its image is a problem mm -hmm. so what you would want is more of a universalist language right. all right you look at Parliament building was built during that time too and it did not go for what I call ethnic centered language. Right. This is how I'm reading it. Yeah. And so perhaps the decision then was to accept more of a universalist one idea and more of a progressive look like technology, you know, right. having this strange roof form. Yeah. So the two ideals of universalism and progressivism, mm -hmm. which the, the country needed at that time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that is more or less the political scenario and the political forces. Now let's look at the architectural movement mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. The movement prevalent at the time was very what we call late modernist. And late modernists have two aspects which uh, we have to consider what I would call the spirit of times mm -hmm. and the spirit of place. Now if you look at the spirit of times, mm -hmm. the idea is to present the building not relating to the historical past at all because the, the, the logic of the modernist philosophy which was prevalent or which had originated in Europe uh, in late 19th century mm -hmm. and becoming very strong in the early 20th century from uh, um, Britain, from Germany, especially from yes. Germany yes. and then from uh, United States mm -hmm. uh, propagated by such persons as uh, Miss van der Rohe Lake of Bouzier and of course the Grand Master himself, Frank Lloyd Wright. Right. So the idea is that the building should not take on any historical precedent because mm -hmm. it should look upon as false, palsu. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of spirit of time is a building such as a dome or mud dome has served its purpose. We no longer have to have domes because of mud you right. could have different kind of structures yes. so it must be built also within a certain kind of state of the art technology mm -hmm. right so in the past if you look at the path uh, pantheon the roman pantheon that was the state of the art mm -hmm. technology the uh, the corbel mm -hmm. masonry system that was state of the art mm -hmm. top notch mm -hmm. only kings and um, right. um, i think the uh, noble uh, yeah the nobles could yeah. afford that for lesser people, it's smaller domes, yes. mud and, and, and little bricks. So it must be state of the art. So if in the olden days you have state of the art in that manner, present, what was the state of the art? Mm -hmm. Folded plate architecture, reinforced concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, if you fold pieces of paper, it becomes yes. very strong. The other thing is that regionalism, the idea that if you're in the tropics, mm -hmm. then you have to design it so that you have more openings for the a lot of openings that. so that the air can move yes. through the building mm. and the remarkable thing about masjid negara which is unprecedented mm. um, in any mosque 
in the Nusantara region is the Serambi. The Serambi is the proportion of the Serambi is so huge. It, 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 it's much bigger than the the, the interior, you know, the, the, the enclosed prayer space. That is really very remarkable. Perhaps the reason was they wanted to have the water, you know, the pond. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The pond, and the pond has to be a significant size. If not, you won't have the cooling effect of wind coming in and, and taking it. So uh, it has this either thing is this Frank Lord Wright horizontality. You know, Frank Lord Wright likes to do this building, which he says is to be humble with nature, following the natural line, of it, the horizon line, which is horizontal. I thought that it was a good idea because it being Islam, uh, the idea of humility mm -hmm. and so with this very horizontal manner and also the fact that it doesn't have a lot any fence at all mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that it was quite modest in its pricing and the use of material, you don't see Persian tiles, too many Persian yeah. tiles, that sort of thing. So um, the, the, the atmosphere <coughs> is very tawaduk, you know, rendah yeah. diri. Yes. Humility, yeah. and you notice it's also what we call. Do you understand asymmetry? Okay. Yes, asymmetry yes. means it's not it's symmetrical. Yes. Yeah. So if asymmetry is more organic, it's more loose, it's more informal. And okay. then that doesn't have to equal to. The yeah, market. as opposed to like a palace, which is, yes. Yes. you know, uh, it's very formal. Yes. Uh, this kind of language was embedded in the masjid. Yeah. So nothing followed history. No Ottoman. No Ottoman slender columns, no domes, nothing. And uh, I think the crenellations, uh, I think, yes. was added later because of perhaps some pressure from the client. But yes. certainly, it's very modernist, what we call very democratic because of the idea of no fencing, asymmetrical. I call it democratic architecture where uh, it's not total, it's as opposed to totalitarian architecture where you have a big fence, setback, mm -hmm. and things like that. So it's a wonderful building and uh, I, I think that we, uh, I mean the architecture community uh, for generations to come should look upon it as something precious uh, for us to learn from. Yeah. So there you are, the political factors and the architectural movement uh, in, in relation to Masjid yeah. Nagara. Now you say 45 years or 50 years now? Uh, yes, yeah. so then there is this move uh, to look Samarkand, Middle Eastern, mm. perhaps a little bit of Delhi. Mm. Perhaps well, you can explain that. Well, in one sense, you are absolutely right yeah. <laughs> in saying all those languages. Yeah. It's the eclectic revivalist time. Yeah. Uh, okay, the scenario of uh, politics and architecture have changed. Let's look at the political scenario first. The political scenario opens uh, with uh, Dr. Mahathir as the leader of the country and as opposed to um, Tunku, he uh, inherited a Malaysia which already has a certain kind of um, what do you call it? confidence, mm -hmm. a certain kind of racial confidence I would say. Number one, the balance between Malays and the other races are different. I mean, it's different. I mean, the Malays are like 60% yeah. and the other races are a bit less than that. So we would say that there is a ethnic um, centered policy mm -hmm. which was in one sense appropriate for the proportion of the yeah. race of the country. Yeah. And so uh, we see him coming into the, uh, um, the political scenario as a very strong, some call it ultra mm -hmm. Malay being very vocal and then remember there was the Iranian revolution time the post Iranian revolution time where Islam mm -hmm. came into the global scenario mm -hmm. and Islam was in some sense some people say uh, was going to replace communism as the so-called threat yeah. uh, to the world mm -hmm. looking at it from the western, western point, yeah. and so uh, Mahate um, incorporated um, such charismatic leaders as say Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim mm -hmm. coming into the picture and between this ultra Malay and this we call it uh, Islamic reformists mm -hmm. both uh, of them took Malaysia into center stage of the global politics suddenly Malaysia is set to become or has been set by Mahathir and Anwar to be the spokesperson 
of the Muslim nation. Mm -hmm. And so, look at the architecture or the, the sense that Mahathir uh, would like Islam to be viewed, not only in the country, yes. but at the global stage. Yeah. If you analyze the speeches of Dr. Mahathir, mm -hmm. you would see that it is laced with a lot of um, examples of history. Dr. Mahathir is a historical individual. Mm -hmm. He reads a lot of history. Mm -hmm. And in Islam, he emphasizes more on the, I would call it, imperial aspects of history, yes. meaning the great Khalifa. Yes. Uh, in order to be great, one must have a strong military. Mm -hmm. In order to be great, one must have incredible knowledge mm -hmm. and technology. In fact, uh, Islam is about uh, this, uh, I call it, kehalusan, mm -hmm. insan, or the human humaneness. Yeah, part of being human <laughs> and and that to me is the uh, the strongest message of Islam not monuments but uh, Mahathir choose mainly to concentrate on the post-prophetic era of this empire building up that's the closest statement I would call it now I'm not saying this in a negative sense I'm just I'm just saying it in a historical sense that's right. what he uh, he views he saw in order to be in, in order to save Islam in this world you have to be strong yes. you know be strong military power technology knowledge yes. so it's not surprising that he fell on this Mughal Empire Persian Iranian Empire mm -hmm. the Ottoman Empire excited him mm -hmm. and he would like to have a bit of both as you have a right. bit of all yes and that's what we call eclectic architecture right. so it's domes, uh, domelets, domes, minarets, arches, E1 gateways, the lot. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at the mosque that was built, he even carved a whole artificial lake so that one of the uh, things that he could do was to float mm -hmm. the mosque at the center mm -hmm. and so that it becomes a sculptural piece, mm -hmm. a kind of a monument a kind of a, uh, well, as I say, a national sculpture, mm -hmm. like the Tugu yes. Negara, yeah. the, the national monument. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think that that was the scenario of that time. Now, a shift, shift to the uh, architectural scenario. What do we have? We have what we call postmodern architecture. Mm -hmm. Now, postmodern architecture contradicts modern architecture in many ways. Mm -hmm. First part is that they believe that architecture must have some ties with the historical past. Mm -hmm. The modernists, remember, reject in right. total yes. the historical past because spirit of time, that time is already gone. So postmodernists say, no, you cannot not know history. So you must have. Even in our culture, I mean, minus uh, history, what do you have? Just a walking flesh and bones, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you have to have some elements of history. And so uh, there are various ways to, to, uh, to do this. Uh, there is adaptation, there is abstraction, but there is also what is called revivalism. Okay. Okay, revivalism means you take something which is supposedly to be dead mm -hmm. and revive it mm -hmm. and make it alive and even more so. All right. So it's supposed to be building of domes uh, with masonry and all that is gone. But here you, you, you're using it back. Mm. But you don't use masonry. Right. You use steel. Yes. But you make it look like right. masonry. Mm -hmm. so that's why sometimes postmodern revivalism has been criticized as being false by the modernists, mm -hmm. as being untrue to itself. If it's concrete, it's supposed to look concrete. Mm -hmm. If it's timber, it's supposed to look timber. But why make uh, this uh, uh, steel dome, mm -hmm. rib, steel rib domes, mm -hmm. look like masonry or the outside you see the the the, the, the cladding yeah. it looks like big large stones of masonry mm -hmm. which it's not it's just reinforced concrete and then you just put a, mm -hmm. a facing over that mm -hmm. well I, i'm doing criticism here but but this is what uh, the modernists would right. uh, would uh, say uh, that is not a nice building in that sense mm -hmm. like the pwtc or the bank uh, 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 i call it ballooning architecture uh, you take a Malay house, you sort of yes. blow onto it and it goes bigger. And, and in some sense, it's not very creative. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot have that uh, kind of attitude in design, in mm -hmm. some sense. Mm -hmm. So, back to the uh, postmodern revivalism, there you have it. You have 
an architecture profession which in one sense was not as visionary as the ones that was in 1960. The architects of that period, if I may venture criticism, was more towards what would the client want mm -hmm. rather than what the architecture profession feels uh, best portray the, the situation of the idea of democracy. And say for instance like the Masjid Negara, the idea of democracy, the idea of a new nation, the idea of, of a multiracial country. I think the profession simply left out all those issues. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you certainly cannot find it in this uh, uh, postmodern revivalism right. of Masjid Putra. It's got the big Iwan that is very feudalistic mm -hmm. in its architecture. And if you look at the uh, Iranian architecture, oh, of course they were commissioned by the Khalifa. They are very feudalistic. Why must a mosque be um, associated with Arabs or Middle East? Why can't it take, for example, a Nusantara appeal? That's a very good question, man. And in one sense, uh, when I give a talks on Islamic architecture on, on one part, uh, on one part, uh, if you look at the traditional past, if you go to uh, many parts of the world, uh, you will see different forms of Islamic architecture. The mud construction, the right. masonry construction yes. are slightly different. In Africa, Timber, in, in, in Africa, Africa yes. will be different. You know, you you, yes. you, you, you deal with, uh, with what you have. Yes. But of course, if you get into the the, the state architecture, like, yes. like being commissioned by the king, they right. can afford to bring artisans. They can force people to carry stones from far places. Mm -hmm. So you have a different kind of architecture. So sometimes you have to be careful about folk architecture and yes. this monument uh, in order to read yes. and understand architecture. Well, well back to your, the, the question of uh, why not Nusantara? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Why not indeed? Mm -hmm. We have a very strong tradition of the uh, Bumbung Meru mm -hmm. uh, being the Nusantara mm -hmm. attack, whether it is uh, three-tiered, two-tiered, or even you have a bum bum panjang or the gable ties and uh, uh, these kinds of things. Why do you have to go to this Middle Eastern? Uh, does it mean that Islam is Middle Eastern? Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not. Nobody would, would, would say that. But again, uh, you would resort to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can offer a, a number of explanations. Number one, in order for you uh, to inspire the client, you see, Remember, uh, in, in doing a building at 2%, the client who pays the money and the architect who does the work. Mm -hmm. If you have a weak professional architect mm -hmm. who just views it as, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll build you the uh, house in paradise if you have the money for it. You know? okay. and, 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 and it's okay. Uh, it's professional in the sense if it's a, a private project, mm -hmm. meaning if it's uh, the, the palace of a yes. king, but if you're looking at a mosque, it's a public building. Mm -hmm. The architect has to take on the notion that, okay, a client is paying, but, but what about Islam? Or what about future generation? What about the Muslims at the present time? How would they look at, say, four minarets? Wouldn't that be a bit wasteful? You, you, yeah, you yeah, understand? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you must look into things like that. What would people think mm -hmm. Islam is? Mm -hmm. Just because a client pays for it doesn't mean that you just build according to what the price is. If it is a public a project, meaning a pub project which is going to be used by the public. If it's private residence, different. You can do five uh, uh, swimming pools, one in the fourth floor, and eh, nobody. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But here it's different. So I would criticize that the architect of Putra Mosque mm -hmm. perhaps uh, did not uh, uh, advise. Um, professionally, in the sense of looking at, we have the Nusantara. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it's not to say that we don't have a lot of publications on it. Mm -hmm. We have a few. All the books are of Ottomans, Seljuks, Persian, Mogul, it's a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But on the Nusantara, there's very few. Mm -hmm. So, it's not that world class idea in a sense, because it is not publicized. Mm -hmm. The other aspect, you not only have to have a historical uh, precedent, you also have to have a theoretical framework to, right. you know, uh, to uh, to adapt it. Mm -hmm. How do you take this without using the balloon effect? The balloon effect is only one. Very uncreative, I would say. But there are many ways you could uh, do that. I mean, uh, classical Greece have a certain kind of architectural language, Greek architecture. But uh, Michael Graves, uh, Charles Jenks, William Morris, they have a whole plethora of 
different ways of of making it not like the old, but using fire. We're not very strong in that. So the theoretical framework is not not there. The, the philosophical framework is doing that. Uh, I used to say in one article that the uh, Malaysian architect is uh, usually having the attitude of wait and see and then change sikit lah attitude. Meaning, let's say what happened in the West and then we we'll just take it and then we'll do it. So the act of thinking is a bit too much for them. So in this sense, they would let the client specify and the, the, the fact that the architect would just uh, agree totally to the idea of this imperial architecture is something which uh, is quite obvious. Mm -hmm. Because I could then question such things like, well, where is democracy? Where's the idea of democracy? Where's the idea of you know the parliament building? Where's the idea of accessibility, easy access to people, mm -hmm. closeness to people? Why this big gate? And then I could, you know, we, we, we have to question all this. Uh, so here we see uh, this uh, postmodern revivalism and also eclecticism. You can see the Persian domes, you can see the very slender Egyptian or maybe slightly abstracted Ottoman uh, minaret. Uh, certainly the Iwan is a dead giveaway for uh, Iranian architecture. Looking ahead, um where do you see um, the direction when it comes to the architecture of a mosque? Moving ahead uh, to the future, <laughs> it depends uh, really on the, the, the profession and the architecture schools. How or in what manner will they produce the students? Uh, at the moment, I would call them as service providers, not visionary. A visionary architect would even go to the point of, you would say, like Le Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright, trying to solve the nation's problem, say, in better housing, uh, better city planning, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And so, in the question of national monuments, such issues as, as it, democratic architecture, accessible to people, um, you know, uh, regionalistic, so that there's not too much overuse of, of, of energy. Like in the Putra Jaya, you can see there's not too many overhangs to cut off the sun. Uh, it's as if saying like, it, it doesn't matter how much it costs, we can pay for it. You know, That's how it, it looks. Uh, the, the, the French architecture that Putra Jaya was based on, it's alright, they don't have overhang because over there it's, the climate is uh, different. Uh, but here you, you need a very huge overhang, like the Masjid Negara and the Parliament building. Uh, that you could see the uh, uh, the attempt by the architect uh, Ivo Shipley to to have it so that you don't have too much of it. I call it accountability. It shows that the parliament or the country or people inside it are very conscious of how they spend the money. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you don't do those things, then it gives the impression that you you're overly rich, you're you're, you're wealthy beyond incredibly your means, mm -hmm. or you're just very wasteful. And so that explains it in that manner of not being very accountable in that sense. So, the architecture profession has to be a bit strong in this sense. Uh, but I think we have a long way to go. 